You're listening to Let's Talk About Fatherlessness with host Sean Tice, where we talk about leading fatherless families to the Heavenly Father. Hey, this is Sean Tice, your host of Let's Talk About Fatherlessness. Uh, just excited to have another episode to go talk to someone else about the issue of fatherlessness. Uh, this issue is an epidemic in our nation, and so we're talking about it in all different ty- types of ways, different ministries, different individuals. Today, we have Eric Swift with us. Um, he is from Outdoor Adventures. He's from the um, the Alliance for Defending, I'm sorry, Alliance for Ending Fatherlessness, right? Is that how you say it? That's close enough. Did I mess it up? <laughs> no, you did. You, tell us about it. Tell us about it. No, no worries. Well, the Alliance for Ending the Fatherless Epidemic, we just go by the Alliance for short, essentially is a collaboration of like-minded ministries like yours, Sean, that work together. We believe that there's no competition in the kingdom of God, and we believe that you know God has made us all unique in our talents and our gifts and our strengths, and the more that we collaborate in the body of Christ, the more that the ball is going to get moved down the field. That's great. Just, just tell us, tell us more about how you um, got into this ministry. Tell us about your background. Just give us information about about Eric's with him. How did you get a passion for fatherlessness, and then how did you get into this ministry? Well, the Cliff Notes version is that I had a really, really rough childhood, mm-hmm. and um, the truth is, I'm at a point now where I can share even the the deepest, darkest parts of that. Um, I was abused as a kid um, sexually. Uh, I've been through uh, utter poverty. I've experienced uh, the life of a criminal. I've been on the streets. Um, I've been a drug addict. You know, I've been through so much. And as I met the Lord and began to walk through a healing process and just growing closer and closer to him, uh, you hopefully know how the father is, right? He wants to heal us and he wants to make us whole. And he wants to redeem us in every way. And as I went down that journey, right, um, ultimately, I started to notice so much of the way that I behaved and so many of the things that I did, uh, even after finding God, were to seek validation, you know, and to try to find um, meaning and purpose, um, but all in all the wrong ways. And I, I began to see just clearly that I was operating out of woundedness. I was seeking validation uh, because I didn't have it growing up. And I was seeking attention because I didn't get healthy attention growing up. And so from my own addictions to all of the struggles I've had, I just began to see that so much of that was pointed towards the perversion of the family unit that I grew up in and how because of the way that looked, uh, I was operating out of woundedness 24-7. So You know, I went into the the business world after serving as a United States Marine, and both of those things were out of woundedness, right? If I'm tough, I'm a United States Marine, I go shoot bad guys, and, you know, I'm a part of the winning team, then maybe I'm a man, right? And in business, you know, I grew up in poverty, and so maybe if I have enough money, I'm successful enough, then perhaps then I have earned the right to be a man, and and maybe I'm worth something, and, and maybe people will view me in a different way, and maybe then I'm validated, and And so that just kept going on and on. It's a never ending story. Uh, What I found was that God is the only one that can validate us. Mm -hmm. And he called me out of a successful business career and even called my wife out of being an attorney for a big oil company to pursue ministry uh, with all of our heart and all of our resources. So we walked away from the American dream, so to speak, and uh, we began to really focus in on helping end the fatherless epidemic and helping amazing guys like Sean um, accomplish this mission to where fatherlessness is not the average experience for the youth of this country and participating in the work of God and building his kingdom in the here and now so that we can make families whole and, um, and basically inspire the church to stand up and do what they've always been called to do, which is to go forth and multiply and to create more people that would glorify our Father in heaven. So that's really it. Uh, I began to see in the youth that we were serving and all of the broken places that we were serving in, uh, these kids were fatherless. And I could see in them so much of myself. I remember the first place I started to serve, Sean, a kid was burned alive for $30 in his wallet uh, on an old soccer field. And I just saw poverty and brokenness 
and all kinds of depravity and suffering. And my heart broke for it. I just, I just couldn't help it. Like I had to do something about it. And part of that was because I saw myself in those kids. And part of it was because the more we draw close to the father's heart, the more our heart looks like his and we're compelled to do something about it. So in a nutshell, that's where we're at today. In 2014, we started a fatherless camp ministry, which still exists today. That's called Outdoor Adventures. You can find that on outdooradventures.org. And then in the process of that, uh, we started also noticing other ministries that were getting started or wanted to get started, but they didn't have the resources or the know-how. And we just felt the Lord saying, there's no competition in the kingdom. There's no competition in the kingdom. So we began to share our trade secrets and begin to share what we had found to be successful with other ministries. And then we started noticing there's other guys out there like Sean, who know a whole bunch about fatherless ministry, and, and they can also help in raising up these next generation of ministers who are going into dark places on the other side of the railroad tracks, and also in the suburban neighborhoods on the other side of the tracks uh, to help end this epidemic. Yeah, that's, that's so good. And um, and then we're going to go into more of what you said you know, the, on the uh, the other side of it with your ministry and stuff. And I want to go back to your childhood, if you don't mind. And you know, we're all about redemption stories. And so would you tell us more? Now, was your dad gone? Did he Was he not there when you were growing up? Or was he, he live with you and he was absent? What was the story there, if you don't mind sharing? Oh, I don't. I'm an open book. So my dad is is a great guy. He's actually on his deathbed right now. He's mm-hmm. got terminal cancer. He's pretty much bedridden and he's not even able to eat a meal. So we don't know how much longer he has. Uh, but my dad and I have since reconciled. Um, my dad is a, a great friend of mine and um, and we have a beautiful story of redemption. And so I want to start there because when you look back, it just gives a, a completely different uh, perspective to our story. So my dad and my mom divorced when I was two. And during that divorce, my mom took us to the other side of the U.S. And my dad had a, a child with his first wife, and he kept her, had full custody of her, rescued her uh, from a mother that was a heroin addict and an abuser. She was found by the cops in a in a closet um, when they uh, rescued her. And my dad raised her up and was was a relatively good father to her in many ways. Uh, my mom took the other two, myself and my sister, and um, she was um, she was not in a healthy situation. So she was definitely uh, growing up herself, came from an abusive home. So she was struggling with drugs and alcohol and partying and it was a very unhealthy lifestyle. But that exposed us to a lot of her boyfriends that we lived with, a total of about eight different men over the course of my childhood. Uh, that we lived with that she was either married to or dating. And so really it was a family court system issue, right? Uh, The family court system really tried to push my dad out. Hey, you pay child support and we'll let you have custody sometimes. Um, But ultimately a lot of the power uh, was given to my mom. When in that scenario, uh, the truth is it might've been better if I'd been with my dad or been put into foster care. Wow. um, It's just a really rough situation. Um, And ultimately as you go through the story, my dad found God. Uh, my dad and I uh, reconciled, spent really good quality time together, have gone on adventures together. And um, I've forgiven him and he's forgiven me for the teenager that I was. And uh, just a really cool and beautiful story of redemption. And now I get to be a daddy and God is completely redeeming that story because I get to be a daddy that looks more like our daddy upstairs. Yeah, that's so good. And and I love how you said, now, now, when did you reunite with your dad? Was was he around at all when you were a teenager or was it, was there a time where it was like, hey, we, when was that? Young adult? I mean. So we, we had a couple of Christmases with him growing up. Uh, we would sometimes be with him on the weekend and, and there were a few summers where we would actually be with him for a month or two in the summer. And, um, and then go back to my mom's house on the weekend. So they'd sort of reverse custody there. Um, but early teenage years, he went through some tragedies and went through some personal tough times himself. So the last time I really spent with him, he was actually homeless. And I stayed with him for quite a while while he was homeless, living in a tent and fishing wow. and providing food that way, uh, living out of a vehicle. 
And, um, and then at that point, uh, I, I don't remember if it was 13 or 12, somewhere around there, uh, he became a, a long haul trucker. He pretty much lost everything he owned and moved into a long haul truck and, um, and became a trucker and was out on the road. So I would see him for like my Marine Corps graduation, he'd pop in. Um, or I would see him every couple of years when I got back from the Iraq war, uh, as a Marine, he came and visited me out on base in North Carolina. And so he popped in occasionally, but, uh, there was a long stretch there where I only saw him, you know, a couple of times. Yeah. Was over the top ever one of your favorite movies? Um, it's a good one. That's up there. <laughs> you I know why I said, you know why I said that, right? Because of the, uh, the scene where the dad shows up with his truck to the son's, um, graduation. Yes, that's that. It just reminded me. You said that. It reminded me of that. My brother used to watch that movie all the time. Um, we had truckers in our family, and my dad was gone, and it was just one of those movies. It was like it just spoke to you as a fatherless kid. You know what I mean? But yep. it just when you said that, it reminded me. I'm like, that's like that, like the kid on the uh, the show, the, or over the top. So, anyways, I know it's a random random thing to say. But no, whatever. no, that was it. Man. He showed up. He had to come from like New Jersey to California in less like wow. two days. And uh, it, he hadn't had sleep in three or four days, but he was in the bleachers. He saw me That's graduate. Awesome. And then I'd say reconciliation happened probably um, 19, 20 years old. Uh, I think my family started to come back together after I got back from the war. During the you know During the war, obviously, I was out there on the front lines. And I think everybody was a little bit spooked that I wasn't going to come home. And you know how it is, you know, when tragedy strikes and things get tough, people start to unite and stop squabbling over small things. And so I think that's when we started talking more, but it was probably not until my mid twenties that him and I, we went on a trip to Alaska together. I took him deep sea fishing and um, we just connected. It was the first time we really had like a father son bonding experience um, in my that's adult cool. years. Yeah. Now did he now did he grow up in a rough home? Oh not? yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have a documentary coming out. Um it'll be uh airing um nationally March 31st at 5 p.m. Central Time through YouTube. Okay. You can look at it um on YouTube if you just search the fatherless epidemic, it's gonna pop up. You'll see the alliance logo. But I go into that um in, in quite a bit of detail on that. Okay. Okay, and we'll include that in the show notes too. We'll make sure we awesome. have that link and everything. Um, yes, I, I just I love your story because you're coming from all different sides of fatherlessness. And so even your mom, you said your mom grew up in a rough home. Now, did she ever come out of her struggles and things? Is she doing okay now, or what's her story? You know, she improves every day. And you know, I always want to honor my mother and my father. That's a big thing for me. But you know, both of my parents came from generations of brokenness that funneled down. And and each one of those was increasingly worse. And so um I could say that there's still tremendous father wounds on both sides. Um, but my mom, she's been divorced three times. She lives by herself, she's on the verge of retirement. And she's, I know she still is getting counseling. She's still working through so many things and our relationship has improved over the years. And we don't talk about that a lot in the fatherless ministry, right? But the struggles between me and my mom were uh, in many ways worse than my struggles with my dad and I, with my dad and I was more of an absence, more of a feeling and a sense of abandonment and not being initiated by a father figure and being validated by a father figure and being introduced to our heavenly father by a father figure. But with my mom, it was utter turmoil. We fought like cats and dogs for years. And I ended up leaving home about 15 years old. So, so we, I could say now we have a a healthy relationship with healthy boundaries. Her and my wife get along well. Um, But again, there's still remnants of that, um, that woundedness for sure. Yeah, no, I understand that. I had the same type of thing. My mom, I moved in with my grandparents when I was in, uh, before my second grade year, my mom moved in with a, another guy with with my brother and sister. They lived in a different house. So by the time my mom moved back in, whenever I was in about ninth grade, we were friends. It was more of a friendship than a mother-son relationship. So it kind of just, just changes things. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. hard to explain, but it's like, well, you haven't been around for uh, seven years, you know. What I, mean? I mean, you, you, you would, I would see you all the time, but I didn't live with you. There wasn't this mothering um, continually in the house, so it just ends up being a. It, it's it's just hard to explain. But it's it's kind of weird um, situation, but yeah. And so now, I mean, my mom and I were, were you know we get along and we're we're friends and stuff like that. But it was just 
it's weird to explain. It's hard to explain all that, how, how things change. And, and there was, there was a lot of, like I said, a lot of fighting and things like that. When growing up, we were kind of mis- coming to our house. It was like, we were like an Italian family. We'd be yelling at each other and stuff. And, you know, yeah. we thought it was normal, you know what I mean? <laughs> but this, it's, a, it's a war zone, but to us it's normal. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, shifting over to now, you you with your situation with your family shifting over to how did you then um tell more about your story of how god became your heavenly father long story short laying next to a toilet dying from drug withdrawals um uh, you know i had been through, what age what age was this this was right after my 18th birthday january okay. 4th um 2000 8 30 in the morning um i had I lost my high school sweetheart in the span of a year. I'd lost her. Uh, I was stabbed and almost murdered in a gang fight. I'd been arrested and and lost my driver's license and, you know, went to jail and had to serve community service and all these things. And uh, I had lost some friends and been stabbed in the back by people I thought were my ride or dies. And there was just so much going on in this small period of time that just kept making me more and more angry. And, you know, ultimately, um, I was ready to end it. I was just exhausted. I, I, that's the best way to explain it. You know, when when I tell people I almost took the the easy way out by committing suicide, I I was just tired. I was utterly exhausted. I think there's a bunch of exhausted people walking around the world right now that can relate to this. They're just tired. You're exhausted, and um, you just want rest. You just want some peace and some tranquility and and um, some stillness and. There was none of that. I was utterly exhausted and I was giving up. And in a last ditch effort, I cried out to God. I had no religious upbringing. I had no idea really what the gospel was at all. Um, I could not articulate the gospel to you. Um, But supernaturally, uh, God revealed himself to me. And I knew for sure that I was in the presence of a holy creator, the creator of the universe that stands outside of time and space. I was with him. He revealed himself to me. And I knew in the presence of his holiness that something was missing. <laughs> I was like, I am not worthy to be in this situation in his presence. And I don't know how else to explain it other than I needed a savior. I just knew that when you're in the presence of a holy God and you're not holy, you just know this isn't okay. I need a savior. I needed to be rescued in life, but I knew somehow spiritually I needed to be rescued. And God revealed himself to me as Jesus, um, that he is the real deal, that he did pay the price and he was offering me a free gift. I felt like the guy on the cross next to Jesus, you know, he didn't get a bunch of theology, (laughs) you know, like, you know, Hey, can I be with you in paradise? Yeah. Come on in. That was me. I said, yes had no theology, no upbringing um, in church. And when I said yes, I immediately knew I was a child of God. I knew that uh, I experienced peace that I've never felt before. Um, I wasn't suicidal. In fact, my drug withdrawals immediately ceased. And um, it was just an utter miracle, utter, utterly miraculous um, entry into God's family. And uh, that was the best way to explain it. I I knew I was a part of God's family. I knew that I was forgiven. I knew that Jesus had saved me. And all I wanted to do was learn more about who this God was. Like, I I just wanted to know him. It was a natural thing. Knee-jerk reaction. I want to know God. I want to do what he tells me to do. And I want to keep going in this direction. That was it. And so I just knew, like, he told me, read a Bible, (laughs) go talk to those people at your school that are uh, Jesus freaks that are always singing songs about me. Tell them what I showed you here. (laughs) Tell them your story. I'm like, they're going to think I'm crazy. And those are the same kids I was mean to. And, uh, you know, all these things. Right. But I I said, okay, yes, sir. And uh, man, I was embraced by the family of God. Um, It was absolutely unbelievable. So that's how I met him. That's great. That's awesome. Um, now going into your ministry. So how did you go from that to, Hey, I want to help other kids out. Just inspire others that are thinking about doing the same. You know, I think you, you, you put it perfectly. Everybody can do a little bit like I'm getting my doctorate right now in in ministry. And I, you know, I, I love what someone said in my introduction class, you know, how do you eat an elephant (laughs) Mm. one bite at a time? 
you know, not everybody needs to go into ministry. If that were the case, we'd be in trouble. There are missionaries that flip burgers for a living. There are, are missionaries in the business world. There are missionaries in all avenues of life. That's the way God created us, to all have a calling and a gift that we can contribute to the world. But while we're in that calling, while we're assigned to that job, that vocation, that occupation, that we would breathe the light of Christ into that environment. And so I think every single person that follows Jesus can take one bite out of that elephant by just simply serving the fatherless or the single mother that's in their sphere of influence right now, whether it's a neighbor kid and, hey, come with me, I'll give you rides to sports practice since my kids are already in it. Um, Or that kid in the pew at church that is uh, always sitting by his mom, but never a dad present. Just be looking. Just I think that's one of the key things that you hit on, Sean, so perfectly is, is develop an awareness of the Holy Spirit. Allow the Spirit to lead you every day, all day. I love what a famous theologian said. His name escapes me, but he says, if we don't dedicate, oh, it's Richard Foster. If we don't dedicate our lives to serving Jesus, even in the mundane things we do every day, we're basically excluding God from some of the most important and biggest portions of our life. So it's in the mundane things. It's in the everyday things. If we're attentive to the Holy Spirit, and we just pay attention to orphans and widows and those hurting around us. We might be asked to zip across the parking lot in Walmart and, and go give a guy a $20 bill and tell him Jesus loves him and give him a hug. You know, we're, we're going to experience ministry in the day to day. It's not church sphere, ministry sphere, my job, my family. No, Jesus wants to go through all of that. He wants to permeate every sphere of our life. And so my encouragement to anybody out there is just do a little bit, you know, at a time, do a little bit each day. Pay attention to the opportunities that are right in front of you. It could be a waiter at a restaurant. It could be the person that delivers your, your packages to your house. It, they're there. They're, they're, the fatherless are everywhere. The single mom is struggling everywhere, but they're putting up a false facade, acting like they're a normal person that doesn't have wounds that need addressed and don't need help. So we just have to pay attention and be discerning. Um, but for me, I was called into the ministry again. I I tried so hard because I grew up so poor to be rich, made tons of money in my 20s. But I still, after having all this money, I was absolutely miserable. I tried to be the tough guy, the warrior, the hero in the Marine Corps. I experienced all that. Still miserable. And I call this the second emptiness. As a Christian, you're filled by God and he satisfies your soul when you get saved, right? But there's a second emptiness that so many Christians feel. That's why you see so much depression in the church, so much anxiety, is ultimately we're experiencing a second emptiness, which is we are not living out our calling and walking in obedience to Christ on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> so we feel this emptiness because we're distant from the Lord. When really what it means in the Bible when it says to pray without ceasing, that means that we're aware of God's presence and we're present in his presence all day, walking in obedience and all the things he wants us to do throughout the day, because he wants to use us throughout the whole day. And we get to experience his presence and walk in his presence. It's the greatest adventure I've ever been on. And honestly, serving God is the most exciting thing that I do. And I love it. And every day is an adventure and something new. And I'm being challenged just by listening to the spirit and obeying. For me, After trying to fill my void and all these gaps in my heart and that second emptiness with literally everything, business, the Marine Corps, sports, women, all these things, um, I finally surrendered. I got a phone call from a stranger who told me to sit down. This was 41 minutes. I journaled it 41 minutes after I was on my knees crying out to God. I hate my job. (laughs) I'm making all this money, Lord, but I hate my job. My job is horrible. I was miserable. I was making all this money commuting three hours a day, working on the 58th floor of a skyscraper for billion dollar oil companies, wearing a suit, driving the nice car, had the nice house. And here I am, like I'm on my knees crying out to God. I give up. Like I give up. Like I'll do whatever you want, Lord. You can pay me a a, a dollar an hour. I don't care about money anymore. And I had to lay down that last idol. That's my encouragement Mm -hmm. too, is lay down whatever it is that you're afraid of which is why you're stuck in that dead end job when God may be calling you somewhere else. You have to surrender that and just say, I'll do whatever you want me to do, Lord. Use me however you want to use me because he's a perfect father and he knows us better than we know ourselves. When I said that prayer 
41 minutes later, a random person called on the phone and said, sit down. I want you to know God gave me a message for you. He's calling you into ministry. I resigned from my job that week. I <laughs> applied to seminary school <laughs> and, and I haven't looked back at all. And in the process of going through seminary, I was doing a practicum where I had to basically be an intern for an inner city ministry. And while I was doing that, it, it all clicked. I'm serving these kids in the inner city that don't have a dad. It wasn't a fatherless ministry. It just so happens most of the kids in the hood are fatherless. And I realized I don't want to do this big thing where I'm pouring into a thousand kids a week. I want to take a few of them and go a mile deep with them. Yeah. I want to be sort of a spiritual dad to these kids. We started doing that and bringing them on backpacking trips. And, and so that's where it started. That's great. And and so tell us more about um, your adventures. Now, what have you seen with the kids that are fatherless when they go on these adventures? What kind of transformation are you seeing? How's it impacting their life? Um, what are they bringing into that before they even get impacted? Can you tell us about the kids, how people understand what's happening with the fatherless? Absolutely. Well, you know, as a business consultant, my job was to identify gaps and fill those gaps. So God's leveraged that and redeemed that skill. So I can look at ministries and God's given me the ability to kind of see some gaps and, and we try to fill those gaps. One of the big gaps I see is that we are kind of playing the rat race in ministry. We just we got to promote what we're doing so that we get donations yeah. and then we we try to you know continue that cycle. But you know, ultimately what's happening um, is kids are not actually being discipled. People are not actually being discipled. And so we have to kind of begin um, with the end in mind, which is what has God asked us to do to make disciples and teach them how to obey everything that he has commanded us to do. And so um, that's really what I feel called to do is identify those gaps and, and fill those gaps. And what we've noticed is we tend to go and give these kids a great camp experience or a great programming experience, and they have a spiritual high, but then they go home, they've maybe gotten saved, they've prayed the prayer of salvation, they've been baptized or whatever, they've had this great experience, but then there's no discipleship, there's no follow through, there's no depth, And so they end up worse off than they started with because they get abandoned a second time. They go on this great religious experience and meet these loving people and then they go home and they're like, well, okay, I'm abandoned again. And they, they may not say that in their mind, but their father wound inside eternally, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually gets, gets scratched at. And so there's this uneasy feeling and that leads to church hurt and, and it leads them to push away. And now they're not only walking around the world lost, um, but they're wounded and they're sort of opposed to a lot of spiritual um, experiences. So we end up hurting them more than helping them a lot of times. So what we do, we actually uh, require that mentors come with our students from the sending ministry. So if you're sending us students from Detroit, great. Come on down to New Mexico and Colorado. We'll take you on one of the best backpacking camp experiences of your life. But we're looking for one student and one mentor. That's our ratio. So for every student, we want a mentor that comes with them, that's committed when they go home, uh, that that kid is going to get discipled and poured into indefinitely. We don't want a commitment. Hey, I'll commit to a year. But no, like, hey, will you will you pour into this kid the rest of his life? Yeah. Take him under your wing. Teach him about life. Take him on adventures and disciple him in Christ. Those three things. Adventure, life skills, the Bible teaching them about our perfect father. So when they come on a camp experience with us, man, they're going to be initiated into manhood. We have a fraternal order called the Wolf Pack. Our creed is completely biblical. These kids are being initiated into a Christian fraternity. It's one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing they will ever do in their life. Our goal is to bond them with their mentor deeply. We don't want to be the heroes of the story. We want the mentors that go with them to be the heroes. Yeah. So that when they go home, that relationship is deepened and forged. And it's it's really, it's sped up light years. And, and so that's really one of the main goals. And then also to present the gospel clearly, to give them a clear opportunity to receive Jesus into their hearts and to receive the, the Holy Spirit. And, and then we want to begin the discipleship process. And we want to do it in such a profound way that we've created a bookmark between chapter seven and eight in their life 
where they remember when they got saved, they remember when they got baptized, they remember when their mentor and them became really bonded. And it's this experience where, hey, maybe they've never seen a mountain in their entire life and they went to Colorado and this is what they got to experience. Um, And so that's what we found to be successful is it's not bring in the masses. Sean, you know this and I know this. It's it's I have seven adopted sons of my own that I've decided to pour into the rest of their life. And I'm calling other men to do the same thing with at least one son. Call that kid into relationship. Teach him how to change the oil in your truck. Teach them how to balance a checkbook. Tell them things they have got to hear, which is God's the only one that validates. He's a perfect father. They need to be able to address those wounds that that boy needs healing from. They need to be there for that kid sitting around the dinner table on the ordinary weeknights. Uh, they need to have someone on the sidelines watching them at their games. You know, when they're playing basketball and they get a good shot and they look over, they, they need to see that man looking at him going, that's my boy. And you don't have to call yourself a spiritual dad. We say, let that happen naturally. Whether they view you as a big brother or a spiritual uncle, it just so happens I've had kids ask me, will you be my father? Mm -hmm. And with tears in my eyes, I say, yes, I would love to be your spiritual dad. And so um, that's how we win this. We win this by doing what Jesus did, which is spending a copious amount of time doing life with a small group of people and teaching them about the perfect father. Right? Right. You know, and I love this scripture, John 17, 24. I'm a philosopher. I like thinking deeply. I'll leave you with this. You know, what was God doing before the creation of the world? Think about it. What was he doing before there was planet Earth with humans on it? He was a father. Yeah. 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 John 17, 24. Father, I want those you have given to me. This is Jesus talking. He said, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. So in the privacy of eternity, in the Trinity, before anything was created, the identity of God was Father loving his son. Wow, that's so good. Come on. Yeah, and, and so that's our goal, you guys, is to love like the father, but ultimately to point these kids to a perfect daddy that will never let them down, ever. And you just can't do that by going to a program one hour a week. The program you go to one hour a week or two hours a week is a great chance to meet kids, but it's outside the walls of that program of course, done with safety and accountability, right? Yeah. But it's outside the walls of that program that we have real relationship and do life together and they get to experience healing and discipleship and then they get called into leadership and then God will also redeem their story and begin to use them in ministry. And that's when things get really exciting when your ministry has three or four or five generations deep that are making disciples. It, it, it's so good. And, and we have to wrap up here in a few minutes, but I want to end with this. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if it wasn't for people that did this for me, that had been that that dad. And I've I've done this for others. I've invested in them and been there at their games, been there at their stuff. Would you talk to somebody that is discouraged because they have invested in somebody and they, you know, it was great for a long time. And then all of a sudden it was just gone. Like they rejected them later. Or would you speak some um, maybe inspiration to those type of people that are that kind of jaded by it? Yeah. This is a, a long winded question. I'll give a brief answer to, and that is that most of our behavior that's unhealthy comes out of woundedness. Um, the reason I'm a perfectionist and a control freak it, it, and because I and I can be controlling is because I want to control the environment around me so that I'm safe and protected. I don't want to be hurt anymore. I'm tired of being hurt and abandoned and left. And so we we have to instead of continuing to build these walls, we've got to go deeply in prayer. And only the Father can do this. You've got to seek Him and ask Him and invite Him into your wounds. Say, God, would you reveal these things to me? Would you show me where this all begins? Where is the origin of my pain. And when he begins to to heal, you know, those things, he's going to reveal very tough things to you, which is the reason you do all that. And the reason you push people away. And the reason you keep experiencing these things oftentimes is because you're wounded and the, the vibe you give off 
is out of woundedness and it pushes people away and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're discouraged because people have hurt you, it's because we're all a bunch of messed up, hurt people walking That's around true. and we're totally misunderstood, you know, stood and we're trying oftentimes our best, but we we're sinners, we're fallen, we're weak, we're fleshly and we, we make mistakes constantly. And so my encouragement for you is you need to get to a point where you're holding a glass of water that's filled to the brim and you're trying so hard not to drop a single drop of water from that cup. You're walking around and that's your whole focus is to not drop a single drop. That's how focused we need to be on Jesus and on a perfect heavenly father. And we're not going to notice all these other people that are uh, accidentally hurting us or purposely hurting us. So God is going to heal you, but you've got to tap into that. Okay. You have to absolutely go to the father to be healed and understand it's, it's him that we focus on. He's the only one that won't ever let us down. Everybody else. will. That's so good. We have less than a minute left. Tell us how to find you, how to find your ministry. You know, you could check us out at um, www.fatherlessepidemic.movie and you'll get some free resources, free curriculum. Also, you can subscribe to receive the link to our documentary when it releases on March 31st at 5 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Or you can go to fatherlessepidemic.org if you want to become a part of the Alliance. And then outdooradventures.org if you want to hear more about our camp ministry. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric, for being on. I appreciate it. Man, thank you for the opportunity. Love what you're doing, brother. I really enjoyed it. Have a great day. (laughs) Thanks, man. Bye-bye. To learn more about how you can get involved in fatherless family ministry, visit lifefactors.org where you can find some free resources. You can find our books that we have. You can find some, even the program that we have to help you start a single mom ministry within your ministry or within your church. We can all work together to lead fatherless families to the Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm.